final. So to finish off, we'll talk a bit more about uh, carbon taxes. Now I'll, I'll show carbon taxes in the UK. Now, um, compared to the old handout, this has been updated. And when I put the slides, um, I'll put the slides so you actually have the new data up on um, Moodle. The concept here is to actually tax energy related to the amount of carbon dioxide that's emitted. So um, in the UK, that's known as the climate change levy. And if you like, it's the UK carbon tax. Now, in fact, all electricity has a climate change levy on top of it. And this has been changing depending on um, which year. And you can see that it's actually been increasing since April 2013. Um, it's gone up in April 2020. It's going to come back down a bit in April 2021. That is maybe a little bit surprising since the amount of carbon that um, is being emitted from UK electricity has decreased quite significantly over that period of time. But if we look at mains gas, mains gas has gone up. Low pressure gas and coal have also gone up, uh, coal actually quite substantially. So this is one way a country can actually um, reduce its carbon emissions by taxing fossil fuel at use. Now the income can also be used to, uh, for different energy efficiency initiatives. In the UK, originally that was the Carbon Trust. In fact, UK government stopped funding the Carbon Trust about five years ago, so it's now not the case. I think the other thing to point out is that petrol, um, aviation, kerosene and oil are not part of this carbon tax at all. Now that's very controversial in the UK and many believe that in fact they should be. Um, fuel for aircraft is one area that there is no tax anywhere and that's an international agreement. And it's all about health and safety. The argument being that if taxes for aviation fuel were different in different countries, some airline companies may put passengers' lives at risk because they would go to certain countries to buy cheaper fuel and the potential for running out of fuel to do that. So there's a whole um, argument over whether they should be included um, and many people believe they should be included. Now carbon trading, so this is something that was set up uh, by the United Nations. It's sometimes called emission trading and the idea here is having um, a fixed amount of carbon. This is what we call the carbon dioxide equivalent mass. And the unit that's used for this is tons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, and this TCO2E means tons of CO2 equivalent. So for instance, methane gas produces three times the equivalent of CO2. And so if we had one ton of uh, methane gas, that's about three tons equivalent of CO2. So this unit is basically the amount of CO2 that has the same global warming potential when measured over 100 years. And that's how we get the factor of three for methane. The carbon trading to allow, basically allows countries to reach their agreed, fact, it was originally the Kyoto Protocol obligations by paying other countries to reduce their emissions. And the real problem of this approach is that rich countries can maintain very high levels of CO2 emissions simply by paying poorer countries. Now that's considered not to be fair. Um, and also it doesn't actually reduce the CO2 emissions overall. So the economics behind carbon trading does not at all recognize fairness. And many consider the scheme to be extremely unfair, especially to poorer countries. So again, carbon trading uh, was something that was set up in a belief it would re reduce CO2 emissions. Actually, people have found ways around that. 
it's ended up with people paying for forestry that has never actually been planted um, or doing other things that doesn't necessarily reduce the CO2 emissions into the atmosphere. So it's difficult to get systems set up that allow you to uh, trade different levels of carbon emissions and also be able to police it at international levels to guarantee that those reductions in carbon emissions physically happen. So let's look at UK greenhouse gas emissions um, and, and typically what's been measured coming out from different sources. Now this is from, what, what I've tried to do here is take data that's come from Department of Energy and Climate Change in the UK. It's from 2012 data, but also from um, the European Energy Agency in 2011. And you can see in fact, what it's taken is the average global values, which is what are these red lines. So this is the grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour for different forms of uh, emission. The UK doesn't use any lignite coal. Uh, the coal that was being used at this time, you can see here, it's about 930 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. If you actually look at the nuclear performance for the UK in those times, it's about seven grams um, CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. The natural gas is about 440 uh, gram CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour and so on. Hydro um, is down at, I believe it's 22 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Now at the time, there wasn't any data in the UK for wind, uh, any of the solar, biomass or geothermal. So this is why the red dots for the UK performance compared to other countries uh, is not here. But you can see that there's a large variation. In fact, the variations are much bigger in the fossil fuels. The um, hydro is a little bit more difficult because um, most of this for the high levels are small scale schemes with large scale flooding uh, and construction CO2. But it at least gives you an idea of the technologies that are low CO2 compared to the high CO2 and where the UK technology sits so carbon life cycle. Well, if we go back to here, uh, clearly for fossil fuels, it's burning the fuel that creates most of the CO2. And we spoke about before, when we start looking at nuclear, um, photovoltaics, geothermal, uh, wind and hydro, most of the CO2 emissions are life cycle CO2. So that means that when we build the power station, um, it's the construction, but also the operation and maintenance. It may also, in the case of nuclear, be fuel, waste, and decommissioning. But we also, in the carbon life cycle, we've got to take into account all these different um, carbon emissions and how they affect what's going on. So the wind turbine is a good example that there's no carbon emissions from operation. There's no carbon emissions because there there's no fuel being used. But the majority of the life cycle carbon is the construction, the installation, and the, the maintenance that has to go on throughout the whole life cycle of the product. And this is where we get the numbers of so many grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So we showed for nuclear, the numbers are actually quite low, and it's the capital costs that really dominate nuclear. Um, and that, again, is simply because the, the volume of nuclear energy is enormous compared to all the other numbers in the system. When we look at other forms of, well, when we look at renewables, in many of the renewables, it's the manufacturing or construction CO2 that frequently dominates most of the CO2 for the renewables. And part of the reason for that is the the volume of kilowatt hours that they generate in electricity is much smaller. And so the construction or manufacturing CO2 is a much larger contribution to the whole um, CO2 per kilowatt hours. So nuclear, well, nuclear with no direct emission of CO2 from electricity generation. Greenpeace keep on and are still using this phrase, construction produces enormous amounts of CO2. Well, 
you know, here, here's just taking some numbers. These are actually some old numbers from um, the original Magnox uh, power station at Chapel Hall in the UK. So one gigawatt nuclear, it's a carbon footprint of 2.44 million tons of CO2. So this is not negligible. You know, it is a big number. But what we have to do is look at the 40 years um, life at 85% capacity. Now we'll talk about the capacity factors a little bit in a few more slides and you'll see some of the issues around this. But at 85% capacity factor, which is what Chapel Hall actually ran at, uh, we, can, we can do the calculations for um, what is the, the grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour in terms of the construction. So we're really gonna look at this, this statement. So we need to work out the energy. So we've got our 0.85% well, capacity factor, 40 years, 365 days and 24 hours, times are one gigawatt, so 10 to the six kilowatts. And by doing it this way, we can get kilowatt hours. So we end up with nearly three 10 to 11 kilowatt hours. So our carbon intensity, or the carbon that we have from building um, or constructing a nuclear power, this particular nuclear power plant, well, our 2.44 million tons is 2.44 times 10 to the 9 kilograms. We divide by our uh, 2.98 10 to the 11 kilowatt hours. And for this plant, it's 8.2 grams per kilowatt hour. So this was the original nuclear power plant. And actually, there was a lot more concrete put in. Being the first, health and safety was at much more serious level than the, the modern um, pressurized water reactors. So this is a high number compared to the more recent plants. But you can still see 8.2 grams. When we compare it to um, the other things going on, actually, operation, well, mining, processing, enrichment for Chapel Hall was about 25 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Operations and maintenance was 11.6 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. The back end and the fuel reprocessing was about 15 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. And decommissioning was 13 grams of CO2. So the total mean you get for this early nuclear is about 66 grams of CO2. So in fact, for this plant, the construction was the smallest in terms of CO2. So this is why I'm attacking the Greenpeace statement in that it is incorrect and they didn't bother to go and calculate this accurately. You can do this for all the different plants and there are ways of doing it. Um, it it's a science in itself. It's harder for some of the manufacturing technologies because it depends on a number of factors. And we'll talk about that uh, now over the number of factors. But this is where these numbers came for all the life cycle CO2. Um, and what's actually quite interesting is how much some of the numbers can change and um, vary, really depending on where the plants are sited, but also the capacity factors. And this is why you get such large variance. So these numbers that the IPCC um, and energy policy have done, um, you only get accurate values after a power plant is finished generating because then you have accurate capacity factors. When you're trying to estimate, the problem you have is that you don't know the accurate capacity factors that the power station has used. Now, the, the fossil fuels up here, as we showed, these are really dominated not by the construction CO2 and the life cycle, they're dominated by burning the fuel and the CO2 emissions from burning the fuel. And here's the real problem in doing all this. So what I've got in this slide is the capacity factors for a whole series of different power plants. And what you can see here is how much it varies between well, different technologies and different years. And you know, we've worked out the cost of energy and also this will determine um, the CO2 in grams per kilowatt hours. That's all dependent on the capacity factor of a power station. 
no power station, doesn't matter what the technology is, will run 100% of the time. And it varies substantially, as you can see here. So some of the nuclear power stations actually get pretty high capacity factors, certainly compared to you know, some of the, the wave and tidal stations that are marked in here. So this is only data from the UK. A couple of other things we'll talk about in here. If you see nameplate capacity, that's the maximum generating power. And the capacity factor as defined here is the energy generated in time divided by the time times the nameplate power capacity. So this is the real true definition of capacity factor that's used for all the technologies. So you can think about it as you know, the amount of time that the plant or the wind turbine is generating um, and also as a percentage of the full power capacity of, of that system. And this determines the exact equivalent CO2 per kilowatt hour in the life cycle. And this is what makes life cycle analysis and estimation so difficult because depending on the utility during the generation lifetime of a different power generation plant, that may go up or down depending on investments in renewables, depending on whether, for example, in the UK, if cold fire power stations are closed completely, or if there's new build in nuclear or new build in gas. And then the numbers that you can have can change significantly. So for instance, the nuclear numbers here have gone up because a number of nuclear plants have shut down. And to maintain the base load, the nuclear plants that are still operational have had to increase their output. And so the capacity factor overall has gone up because their operating time has gone up. So there's a lot of different things going on here. Um, and it's quite a complicated slide to really understand all the things going on. Now you can see we spoke about for wind farms, how um, you know, we, we stated a capacity factor where we calculated costs. So for cost per kilowatt hour, and where we looked at the life cycle grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. But actually, depending on the year, the capacity factors will fluctuate because the wind is not constant as we all know. And you can see in fact that, you know, it's gone from maximums of 33.6% here. So 2015 must have been quite a windy year. Um, but even the following year is 27.8% and there's a low of 23.7%. So you can see how much variance some of the renewable technologies may have just depending on the, the weather that you get in a particular year. So when you design for a national grid, you have to take into account potential fluctuations and make sure you have other base load or other forms of electricity generation that can compensate if there's less wind in a particular year. And you hope that in the windier years, it can compensate for other areas, say photovoltaics, that there may be less sun in those years. So this is a very complicated area and why life cycle um, analysis of different technologies for both the cost and the CO2 estimations is actually pretty difficult to do. So total UK energy costs. Well, this was a comparison energy cost in 2010. Um, numbers have changed a bit since then, but you can see it, the particular one here is the offshore wind price has come down um, a lot. But the other thing that's been added into all these costs comparing the different technologies is some of the carbon pricing. So you can see in fact that gas, conventional coal, certainly at these prices in 2010, are still the cheapest over coal and nuclear. Um, but when you add taxation on, you start to make them more expensive. And so this is one way to try and encourage people to use the, the cleaner forms of electricity generation. Now, when we've been speaking about uh, discount rates 
all today. And typically I've used 10%. When I started this course, 10% was the typical UK Treasury numbers being used. Since then, inflation has been low for a long period of time. And in fact, this year, uh, the present UK Treasury Blue Book um, tells you to actually calculate discount rates for power stations. You should be using 3.5%. So you can hopefully this just gives a little bit of comparison. Um, Particularly the renewables in here, the prices are coming down. Um, but hopefully this gives you some of the issues around how you can make the renewables much cheaper than the fossil fuels. But also we've got the volume issues that need to be involved in this as well over which of these technologies you invest in overall for a complete country. So just to finish off, We've spoken a bit as we went through the lectures about some of the environmental impacts. I just want to finish with a couple of slides talking about environmental impacts because certainly a lot of the arguments over why we should move to renewables and sustainable energy forms is because of the environmental impacts. But one of the real problems that perhaps the green lobby have had um, and in arguing to many people why there should be uh, changes is there's no standard measure of the environmental impacts and no internationally agreed um, standard for environmental impacts. And that makes discussions and how you change things more problematic. So when you get to climate change discussions between countries, this is another of the issues that make those discussions more difficult for countries to agree how to progress forward. When you look at the literature, and how different countries, different scientists and um, different publications try and um, divide and analyze these. Generally, environmental impacts are divided by scale, by source, or by the public concern. So we'll give you an example of this, or different examples. With scale, well, globally, the majority of people are worried about the CO2 emissions and the ultimate consequences that should do. But if we start to look at much more regional variations, cities, regions are much more worried about the local pollution that comes from either burning coal or from vehicles, where sulfur and nitrogen oxide emissions are much more of a problematic issue. And so regionally, people are much more worried about those than they are about the global CO2 emissions. Community, we really do get to the pollution from vehicles. Workplace, well, there, you know, the biggest hazards when we talk about energy generation is predominantly from coal uranium mining, but also oil and gas tends to be relatively dangerous environments for, for mining the fossil fuels. If we look at household levels, well, smoke pollution used to be quite a significant issue, uh, certainly in the UK. It's still where uh, burning wood or burning coal in different parts of the world at home, um, that really is, is an area the UK now understands produces a lot of cancers um, and is certainly something that there's environmental impacts to people in addition to the, the carbon dioxide emission issues. When we talk about the public concern, this really is the cancer risks but also the effects of pollution on people, visual impact. So we spoke about this before over the not in my backyard, the NIMBY uh, is what this acronym means, not in my backyard. So wind turbines are one of the big issues around the visual impact where public concerns have actually prevented some of those um, renewable technologies being deployed. If we look at environmental impacts by source, then these are typically divided into the source of energy. So for example, oil, well, like many of the fossil fuels, global warming from CO2, but people are also worried about the air pollution, the acid rain, oil spills, oil rig accidents. Um, any, any outcomes that have environmental issues from oil, 
Natural gas are extremely similar. Uh, here, methane explosions in homes is a much bigger issue uh, than with oil. Um, and gas rig accidents, there have been a couple of, of ones in the North Sea around the UK, for example. Coal, well, again, we've still got the pollution issues around CO2, air pollution, acid rain. One of the ones in Glasgow is land subsidence from mining. And for the students who live in Glasgow, you're probably aware in the West End that there are uh, rows of tenements and suddenly you see a hole. Well, some of those are because of subsidence over the old mining from the Victorian era in Glasgow. You also get spoil heaps from coal mining, groundwater pollution, miners' accidents, and of course, miners being down uh, digging out coal. There's a whole series of health issues around the uh, coal dust and breathing that in. If we look at nuclear, well, typically the biggest concern for most people is about radioactivity, but there's also concern from governments of misuse of fissile materials, nuclear proliferation, um, but also land pollution, uh, health of uranium miners, and so on. Wind power. So as I've said, renewables are, are not um, environmental concern free. So visual intrusion, noise, bird strikes. One of the problems that the White Lees wind farm has had uh, south of Glasgow is there's been substantial interference with television signals when it was originally built uh, in East Kilbride. And it's also had big impacts with radar and communication systems in some parts of the world. So wind is not without its problems. Tidal barrages. Well, we spoke about this when we went through uh, the Cardiff scheme. You know, the, this has not been built because there's been real concern of destruction of wildlife. Uh, there's also a worry of reduced dispersal of effluence if you block a, a river, reduction in passage of boats, there are ways of getting around this. But again, um, renewable technology still has environmental issues. Hydro. So we spoke again about this in the lecture with effects in dam construction, uh, displacements of population, downstream effects in farming, and the methane if you submerge a lot of biomass when you're flooding um, particularly large valleys. And with biomass, well, there's effects in landscape. Um, if you suddenly start to farm um, predominantly for biomass energy, habitats can change. This can also lead to biodiversity changes. Um, it can result in a scarcity of water, competition with food production. So all I'm saying in, in this slide that you can see the different areas there's environmental issues in some of these technologies. Renewables have their own problems. And that's also one of the issues that has prevented more renewables from being used in many different countries around the world. So I'll find a couple of things before we finish. Materials. Well, if you want to build um, a renewable energy source such as a wind turbine, you actually need one ton of neodymium for every megawatt of a wind turbine, simply to build the magnets for the Faraday generators. Now the world production is 20,000 tons per year, it's a rare earth. And this is a real problem that many people are only starting to understand. Sustainable materials, particularly magnetic materials, to allow renewables to be used in much larger densities and much larger volumes, many of the metals required are not in plentiful supply. If we look at tantalum, you know, if you have a smartphone or a tablet or probably a computer these days, it's used in a lot of the capacitors in there. There's only one mine in the world for tantalum. So these are rare earth materials that are essential for many of the renewable and sustainable energy technologies in the future. And yet these are very rare materials and the alternatives are far less efficient and consume much more energy. So there's a whole series of sustainable materials issues that society in the future is also going to have to address um, to actually be able to deal with net zero in the future.
So that's the end of today. And what we've gone through today is trying to have accurate, complete life cycle costing of energy, or at least talk about the issues. It's very difficult to do. Accurate calculations of CO2 emitted from generation over a complete life cycle of any of the technologies we've spoken about really is quite difficult until the generation or the power plant has stopped and you have accurate records of the capacity factors over the complete life cycle. We've gone through the accountancy issues and how to cost energy. So looking at inflation, discounting, time value of money, present value and annuitization. And we've spoken about the issues um, over energy subsidies versus energy taxes and how to try to um, encourage a population and consumers to uh, use different forms of energy. We've spoken about carbon emission trading um, and some of the issues around that of the rich trying uh, paying to trade higher CO2 emissions to poorer countries. And at the end, we've spoken and, and tried to pull together the environmental costs of energies. There's many factors in environmental costs. It's still a developing science and there's no standards that would really help um, certainly the climate change discussions moving forward. So this really is the end of the course in terms of the lecture um, series. And as a final slide, just to finish off, I like to talk about the future because all the students in this course are really the future that are going to have to drive net zero. Um, and there's a big climate change conference at the end of this year in Glasgow, where every country in the world is going to be discussing how to get to net zero and how to have international agreements to get to net zero. I hope you've seen in this course, that's very difficult. Deciding which technologies to do and understanding accurately predicting the life cycle and energy and carbon emissions of each of these technologies is so dependent on the capacity factor it's difficult to predict with some of these new technologies coming through exactly how much carbon emissions you're going to get. It's not just about moving to lower electricity generation. Reducing carbon emissions is going to require changes for everyone, everywhere. Most people dislike change. Countries and politicians are already disagreeing how best to agree the carbon reductions. And also in democracies like the UK, you know, when your job depends on a vote, voters don't really want to change to reduce carbon. It's unpopular when they understand what those reductions are, but there are a lot of people demanding it and it seems popular policies. So there's this dichotomy between the reality of how to reduce carbon and what voters think they need to do to reduce carbon. I think one of the clear things that is very positive that started happening quite substantially over the last five years. Politicians have been very slow to move, but markets and multinationals are starting to understand that profits from many of their businesses, particularly in the energy sector, and particularly oil and gas companies are going to stop due to climate change. So change is required. And this is starting to force politicians to really seriously think about change and how to reduce carbon for the benefit of everyone. Now finding stepping stones to make that change, bigger steps are always much more difficult to persuade people to do. The new generations like yourselves are going to need and drive these reductions to carbon emissions. So you're all the future out there. I hope in what I've given you in this course give you the tools that you can go out there and help to start to reduce carbon emissions much more than has happened over the last 20 years. So with that, that's the end of the course. I'll stop the recording.